And we're back. I was actually going to do a video about the Banerjee case, but alas, public discussion about legal issues has demanded that I do more defo videos. So, big news. The former Attorney General and current Minister for Industry, Science and Technology, Christian Porter, has settled his case against the ABC for defamation. Now, depending on the political media that you consume, you either think that Christian Porter backed down, tail between his legs, and abandoned his claim, or you think that this was a humiliating concession by the ABC, who had to admit that they defamed the Attorney General by publishing material that conveyed false imputations. So, what do I think? Well, I'm a coward, and so my reading is that actually it's a bit of both. This video will cover two topics of equal fascination to me. Damages in defamation, and when do you settle civil litigation? Some people know that I have an empirical law project at the moment on the question of damages in defamation law. So I can confidently tell you all that there are a lot of very, very silly ideas currently circulating in public discussion about these topics. Let's start with damages. Defamation is what we call a tort. It's a French word that means wrong, but you can generally think of it as the law of injuries, provided that you blur your eyes and, you know, don't look too hard at what counts as an injury. Some classic torts, trespass to, la uh, sorry, assault, battery, and false imprisonment. The area of law also includes trespass to land or goods, nuisance, and the true king of tort, negligence. Now, if you prove that you're the victim of a tort, your usual remedy is what we call damages. And damages is financial award by way of compensation. Some examples, as usual. Here is Gandalf and his best friend, Saruman. Now, one day, Saruman eats all of the chocolate ice creams in the freezer, and so Gandalf, in a fit of rage, slashes Saruman's tires. Saruman's all like, hey, that really sucks. Could you please pay me for the cost of the tires? And Gandalf is like, go to hell. And so Saruman makes an application to the small claims court who says, yes, Gandalf owes Saruman a few hundred dollars for some new tires. There's an interesting point here that you might have missed in all this nonsense. Where's the apology from Gandalf? Good question. Here is Professor Robin Carroll from the University of Western Australia. In a 2013 article for the Sydney Law Review, she included this amazing line that I'll put up here now. We know that it is uncommon uh, sorry, we know that an order for an apology is an uncommon, unorthodox, and in the eyes of many, unsuitable as a legal remedy. Her paper works through scenarios where a court or tribunal has issued an order for an apology, or at least something that looks a lot like an apology, such as a corrective notice, as was ordered in the racial discrimination case involving Andrew Bolt, where he made obnoxious and offensive comments about the appearance of some Indigenous Australians. Technicality aside, there is a very strong doctrinal belief that courts should be satisfied that ordinary damages are inadequate as a remedy before looking for other options like specific performance. Now, there was some discussion of this in the fairy tale that I narrated on this channel about the frog prince suing for specific performance of a kiss. Check that video out. It's exactly the same point. Damages are your usual remedy. Saruman is going to struggle to get an apology out of Gandalf for slashing his tires. Now, in the late 90s and early 2000s, Australia underwent something dramatically referred to as an insurance crisis. The damages being paid out, it was argued, was escalating and insurance companies couldn't afford the payouts. The people driving that claim were, surprise, surprise, insurance companies and those who perceived the threat of higher insurance premiums. 
Whenever there is a major push for law reform, especially in tort like negligence or defamation, always ask who profits from the change and invariably there is an industry trying to protect its profits. Now, in the early 2000s, there was a review of the law of negligence headed by Justice David Ip of the New South Wales Court of Appeal. And this is true. In the terms of reference, it stated very bluntly that the award of damages for personal injury has become unaffordable and unsustainable as the principal source of compensation for those injured through the fault of another. It was not open to the review to question if this bold claim was true. Now, the media drove panic using cases where journalists felt that judges were just completely out of control in the award of damages. Now, does this sound familiar? HIH, the second largest insurance company in Australia, went broke, and the media ran story after story of businesses who could not afford insurance. Now, despite these anecdotes, there was very little empirical evidence supporting them. And the panel doing this review only had two months to come up with legislative solutions. Indeed, it was after the IP report was handed down that there was a royal commission into HIH which said, basically, the insurer collapsed due to good old-fashioned incompetence in corporate governance. Now, regardless of the reasoning, the result was the same. Capped damages – legislative interventions to put downward pressure on the damages being awarded, especially for non-economic loss. Each state did it differently, except with regard to professional indemnity insurance, where a very complex interjurisdictional scheme was established, largely so that an accountant based in New South Wales would have the same litigation outcome if they provided advice to a client who was based in Victoria. Anyway, so what does it mean to cap damages? There's two ways of thinking about it. Let's go back to Gandalf and Saruman. They're back to being friends and they share an apartment in Canberra's inner north. Saruman has decided to make croissants and leaves butter everywhere. Gandalf comes into the kitchen looking for the chocolate ice creams in the freezer. He slips and he injures himself. Now, Saruman agrees that he is at fault, but they can't work out between themselves how much compensation he should pay to Gandalf. So they go to court. The first understanding of capped damages is the easiest to understand. The court looks at the injury caused to Gandalf and says, look, I assess that the damages would be $50,000, but damages are capped in this jurisdiction, so I have to cut that award to $30,000. The second understanding of capped damages is baffling, but, as we shall see, will soon be applied in defamation law. The court looks at the injury and says, look, I have a capped scale of damages that goes all the way from $1 down the very end all the way up to $30,000 for the most egregious injuries. I think that this is on the lower end of the injury scale, so I award you $10,000. Now, following the insurance crisis and the capping of damages in ordinary negligence, you would not need to be the brightest person to guess that defamation damages were capped when uniform laws were introduced in 2005. They were. And, like nearly everything in defamation law, it's bafflingly weird. Gandalf and Saruman are now experiencing a strained friendship following the butter incident. Gandalf writes a blog post that goes viral, claiming that Saruman is a friend to the Balrog. This is highly defamatory. He loses his job on the White Council, a role that comes with a very nice salary, and he slumps into depression. So he calls his friend an expert defamation lawyer, She-Hulk, and asks for her advice about suing Gandalf for his publication. Let's just skip straight to the end. Gandalf's post is found to be defamatory, and Saruman seeks 
two kinds of damages. First, he wants economic damages related to his lost job. And second, he wants uh, non-economic damages related to the damage to his reputation and his good name. How does defamation law work this out? Well, first, economic damages are relatively easy to assess. He's lost his job, but he'll get another job. Some real value can be calculated for this economic loss, and defamation law allows this amount to be paid in full. No cap. Second, there's non-economic loss. This is the damage awarded for consolation for hurt to feeling, compensation for damage to reputation, and vindication of the plaintiff's reputation. And here's where things get tricky. Section 35 of the Defamation Act caps non-economic loss. It is currently in the ballpark of $400,000. Oh, sorry, and that's the point that I was trying to make. It's capped. Here's the text. That's the text. We're on the same page. Unless the court orders otherwise under subsection 2, the maximum amount of damages for non-economic loss that may be awarded in defamation proceedings is the cap. And this gets updated year to year. So here are the important words, unless the court otherwise orders under subsection 2. What is subsection 2, I hear you ask? The suspense is killing me. Subsection 2 a court may order a defendant in defamation proceedings to pay for non-economic loss that exceed the maximum damages amount applicable at the time the order is made if and only if the court is satisfied that the circumstances of publication of the defamatory matter to which the proceedings relate are such as to warrant an award of aggravated damages. <gasps> what does all this mean? This is a bit of a summary, but even then, it's still unclear. The key case here is Bauer Media and Wilson. Originally, Rebel Wilson was awarded $4.7 million. How was this calculated? Well, no, sorry, I originally awarded this. Damages for economic loss, the part that isn't capped, was $3.9 million. It is by far and away the largest component of the award. She was able to show that her career was harmed. Non-economic loss, on the other hand, was calculated at $650,000. There's a zero missing on my slide, forgive me. Which, as you can see, is far in excess of the cap. This award was appealed by Bauer Media, which is why we're on appeal, Part of this appeal was that the judge, when awarding damages, misunderstood how the cap was supposed to work. Now, conventionally, there is no separation in an award of general damages between the sum awarded for pure compensatory damages and the sum awarded for aggravated compensatory damages. What does this mean? You normally don't say that the plaintiff has awarded damages for their injury and then a separate amount if those damages were aggravated by the defendant. It's all lumped in together. But what do we mean by aggravated? Simply that it was made worse. If you get injured and the defendant does something to make the injury worse, same lump sum. In defamation law, Aggravated damages are awarded to reflect the conduct by which the defendant increases the harm to the defendant, uh, to, the, to the plaintiff, sorry. Like, completely hypothetically, I don't know where I'm getting this example, making a YouTube video where you repeat all of the defamatory imputations in a faux Italian accent. It draws more attention to the imputations and increases their damage. Aggravation. Bauer Media, on the other hand, argued that Section 35 was to be read in two parts. Pure compensatory damages up to the cap, and then an additional amount on top of the cap to reflect the aggravated damages. So the judge would work out what damages were to be awarded for non-economic 
uh, compensation and then apply the cap and then turn their mind to aggravation to make a separate award of compensation specific to the aggravation complex. Now, the Victorian Supreme Court says, no, this is wrong, rejects this construction and goes with the traditional view. If you have aggravated damages, you ignore the cap and go wild within reason. The Victorian Supreme Court also had to turn its mind to how the cap was supposed to work. So there was a bunch of New South Wales cases which considered how the cap was supposed to function. And Actual and Casey was a very early case using the Uniform Defamation Laws, which adopted the reasoning from New South Welsh practice prior to the Uniform Defamation Laws. And they established that it was supposed to be a spectrum and not a cutoff. Now, various New South Wales cases followed that model. But in Victoria, however, it was seen as a cutoff and not as a spectrum. I understand, but I might be wrong on this, that Western Australia uses this model as well, and the federal court followed this process uh, by applying Bauer and Wilson for the Jeffrey Rush case. So at the moment, we seem to have two different systems of working out damages depending on the state in which you are litigating. But what do you notice here? So imagine that Saruman has not lost his job, but instead only had non-economic losses. He really, really needs to prove aggravation in order to get around the cap. And that is rolling the dice. Dr. Chow, who was egregiously defamed by ABC and Fairfax, was awarded $515,000 in damages that were purely non-economic. Why? He was able to prove aggravation. If he hadn't been able to demonstrate aggravation, it would have been the capped amount or lower. Now you start to see the problem. Litigation is fantastically expensive. In 2018, the ABC suggested that a complicated defamation case could cost in the ballpark of $300,000. I'm aware of recent defamation cases that had higher costs due to their fantastic complexity. It is widely known that Joe Hockey, for example, lost a significant amount of money successfully suing Fairfax, who, as we remember from previous videos, was motivated by malice when it published defamatory videos. You can win your case and come away worse off than when you started. There is an incorrect assumption that people settle cases when they realize that they're wrong. We imagine that they throw up their hands in a road to Damascus scenario. My gosh, I've, I've seen the light and I will back away from my litigation claims. But it's nothing like this at all. Commencing a case and continuing with a case is a complex mix of economics and emotion. You might be absolutely certain that the other party is a complete jerk who does not deserve a single brass rizzo, but handing over $30,000 is cheaper than spending $50,000 on lawyers. Now, this is especially if you're in a situation where you are unlikely to get your costs back. Some of our courts and tribunals are no-cost jurisdictions. Parties wear their own costs even if they win. One thing I cut out of this video is the really fascinating empirical legal studies, which explores what sort of cases are likely to go to court and the algorithm for working out when a robot would decide when to settle. Fun stuff for another time. Let's apply this all back to the Porter case. With all the evidence on the table, was he sure he was going to prove aggravated damages? Was he sure he was going to see most of his costs recovered? Okay. Forget that it's Christian Porter for a moment, and instead, let's consider some fictional person, Daoist Doorman. 
The National Broadcasting Corporation makes a series of allegations about him that are very complex imputations. Dorman wants to sue, but he is not a big-time celebrity. Is he really going to be able to afford to take on a large media organisation? Do we need a better way to regulate the media that doesn't depend on the financial status of the plaintiff? A senior government minister found it difficult to justify the cost. That is incredible, and it really suggests that something is broken here. For all the rhetoric about Australia being plaintiff-friendly, which it isn't really, this should show you that there is an access to justice problem when it comes to suing the big media companies. Let's loop back to the start. The ABC did not need to write its statement of regret on the piece that largely undercuts the sting as well as the whole sizzle of the piece. It could have done this at any time. I must admit that I found it very strange that the original story did not have the usual qualifying statements included. But if it was confident of winning the litigation, it could have demanded that Porter pay its legal costs, and it didn't. It decided that it was in their economic best interests to make some concessions, including paying for the mediation and settle. Christian Porter, on the other hand, was very, very likely to lose a lot of money, even if he won. No obvious economic damage and banking entirely on being able to show that the ABC's conduct aggravated damages. That's it for this one. As always, feel welcome to provide me feedback on Twitter at Legal Reckoning. Sorry for the delay on this one. I have been marking assignments and a big thank you to at Clamino on Twitter for the extremely generous bottle of scotch that she delivered to me. Apologies for the technological fails earlier. Until next time, bye-bye.